It's the start of Blue Lock's second selection, and we're about to witness one of the most brutal defeats in the entire series. With a final score of 5-2, to two, Blue Lock's top three mercilessly display their superiority against their challengers. But as all the hopes and dreams of protagonist Yoichi Isagi threaten to crumble to dust, there's no sign of devastation in his eyes. Instead, every fiber of his being is mesmerized, enraptured by the sight before him, by the beauty of the parabola that Rin Itoshi's goal traces in the sky. This is the moment when Rin becomes Isagi's greatest rival, and that's really significant. Yes, Isagi latches onto Rin because he's in many ways a superior version of himself, but on a fundamental level, it's not Rin's superlative direct shots or spatial awareness that draw in Isagi. Rather, it's because in the face of certain defeats, Rin presented him with a display of awe-inspiring beauty. These are the terms in which their rivalry has been cast. For Isagi to truly surpass Rin means painting an even more dazzling sight than what Rin showcased in their first confrontation. So while the finale of the U20 match is the culmination of countless plots and ideas, it's first and foremost the story of how Yoichi Isagi managed to achieve exactly that. Hello, my name is Sean, and it's finally time to make good on a video that was long overdue. It's no surprise that the U20 match is so beloved among the Blue Lock fanbase. It's a massive payoff to the storylines that Blue Lock has been setting up since its first chapters. And it does so by interweaving Isagi's personal arc from the second selection onwards with the macro-level storytelling of Blue Lock as a whole. To put it simply, the U20 match is both the touchstone to validate the philosophy that underpins the entire Blue Lock program, as well as the moment where Isagi personally proves that he has what it takes to become the world's greatest striker. At its core, the U20 match revolves around two key concepts, beauty and destruction, which, as we'll see, really go hand in hand. But to make sense of this, I need to set out the stakes that underpin the contest between the Blue Lock 11 and Japan's under-20 football team. In chapter 1 of the manga, Jinpachi Ego establishes that the inability of Japanese football to distinguish itself on the world stage comes about from a systematic failure in its football culture. What Japan lacks is a revolutionary striker who can lead their team to the top of the world. And that's because its strikers aren't peerless egoists, which Ego, of course, seeks to remedy with his radical training program. So now the time has come for Ego to display the fruits of his labors. His trainees are pit against the cream of the crop of Japanese youth football, and in doing so, they've been given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change the trajectory of Japanese football forever. This is what's highlighted time and again in the lead-up to and during the U20 match. The victor of this showdown will give rise to a new future for Japanese football. And here, it's significant that the two teams represent two radically different football philosophies. So let's first have a close look at the U20 team and how they, in many ways, corroborate everything that Jinpachi Ego finds fault with in his native football culture. Back in Chapter 1, Ego is disgusted by footballers who prioritize cooperation and interpersonal relationships over tangible results. And let's examine the first scene in which the U20 team appears. 
They're being introduced to their prospective teammates, Ryusei Shido, the violent blue lock ace who immediately picks a fight with U20 striker Shuto Sendo. And right away, the U20 team's captain, comrade Oliver Aiku, expresses unwavering support for his guy, to the extent that the entire team threatens to boycott the match if Shido takes the field. For Sai Itoshi, this is utter madness. He knows that Shido far outclasses the U20 ace, so losing Sendo isn't a big deal to him. But that's not the U20 philosophy. They're a team of 11 players who treasure their bonds, not a well-oiled scoring machine. To me, this is a really interesting first introduction. The manga paints the U20 team in such an admirable light that it almost makes us root for them, exactly in how they're not at all like the squabbling alpha males that we've been following up to this point. Yet this very trait within Blue Lock's philosophy of egoism immediately sets them up for failure. But more than that, the three focal players of the U20 team Aiku, Sendo, and Sai are each, in their own way, the products of Japan's failed football ecosystem. More than that, their stories are narratively interlocked in really interesting ways. The key scene to understanding their respective tragedies comes from Chapter 56, where Ego disparages the Japanese Football Association for squandering opportunities. In Ego's view, their incessant obsession with finding the next big star only ends up destroying hopeful talents. The JFA's approach involves showering unprepared teenagers with unsustainable levels of hype, only to see them crash and burn when they face the world beyond their tiny pond. And as we'll see, the lived experiences of Japan's upcoming players closely mirror Ego's analysis. Let's start with Aiku, whose entire backstory revolves around how he was groomed into mediocrity. As it turns out, Japan's star defender originally played as a striker. But from an early age, Aiku's coaches denied him any opportunity to follow his ego. And as a result, Aiku could only develop within the restrictive parameters allowed by Japanese football, resulting in a kind of conformative blandness, one that guarantees him a stable but unassuming future. Yet, someone like Aiku isn't satisfied with a moderate income and a minor celebrity as his wife. The message is clear. In modern-day Japan, you can't aspire to greatness as a striker. And therefore, Aiku has to compromise on his dream and become a defender to follow his ego. Yet even then, the manga suggests that Aiku is on the cusp of being failed by the system for a second time. We're shown a series of news headlines from Aiku's recent career. Japan's greatest upcoming defender has been hailed as a prodigy and is about to embark on a career abroad. In other words, we're almost seeing Egel's misgivings about the Japanese approach to fostering talent unfold before our very eyes. Aiku the prodigy is about to play overseas, where he's destined to stumble and fall. That brings us to Japan's under-20 ace striker, Shuto Sendo, a character who is so bland that writer Munayuki Kaneshiro couldn't even be bothered to give him a proper name and just phoned in the most generic job description of a striker. Send shot. Sendo is a striker who rose to the top within Japan's football ecosystem, and this shines through in his outlook on life when we first meet him. Sendo is completely enamored with the prospect of an above-average salary and a glamour model as his wife, the exact mediocre lifestyle that Aiku denounced earlier in his career. Sai is absolutely right when he disparages Sendo. 
the depths of their desires are completely incomparable. Where Aiku at least fought back against the status quo, Sendo is more than content with the life of a striker in an environment that brutally stifles talent. That brings us to Sai Itoshi, the most complex character in the U20 roster. The thing about Sai, in contrast to the two earlier figures, is that the manga does not unequivocally paint him as a success or failure. For one, Sai is clearly depicted as the most talented player on the pitch. He plays as a midfielder, yet showcases more showing prowess than the U20's actual strikers. And more than that, at the game's very inception, Sai is cast as the future of Japanese football. He's the sole reason people are tuning in for the match in the first place. Yet, even so, Sai is also a product of a failing system. Let me turn to Egil's speech about the JFA's approach to nurturing talent one more time, and in particular to the image of the hopeful prodigy boarding a plane to develop a career overseas. And that's the exact snapshot we get of Sai leaving for Japan, trolley in hand, ready to face the world. That trolley also features prominently in the scenes following his return to Japan, as a symbol of sorts for the hopes and dreams that Sai once carried with him. Yet Sai's experiences are exactly as Egil had outlined. He discovered firsthand that the world is much larger than he'd anticipated brimming with talents that even eclipse Japan's brightest star. In that light, it's really telling that when Sai lashes out against Rin, he comments on how the Japanese way of doing things transforms exceptional talent into mediocre trash. Yes, Rin may not have lived up to his full potential, but it's hard to shake the impression that Sai is using Rin as a conduit for his frustrations about his own shortcomings. After all, Rin is now a rising star, whereas Sai sees his own prospects of becoming the world's best slipping away before his very eyes. That brings us to the Sai at the start of the story. The manga makes it clear that even despite the setbacks he's experienced, Sai still harbored the ambition to become the best in the world. Sai is an egoist through and through. However, in his first appearance in the manga, Sai makes it clear that he has lost faith that he can fulfill his dream by winning the World Cup. In his view, Japan is incapable of producing a striker worthy of his passes. This is something he brings up repeatedly in the U20 match. He's convinced that Japanese strikers will never measure up to the standards required to reach the top. And with that, Sai's decision to become the greatest by winning the Champions League is presented as a compromise of sorts. A compromise on his dream to win the World Cup with Rin. Even Sai can't see himself sparking enough miracles to lead Japan to a World Cup victory. And so, he has sought out an alternative avenue to fulfill his dream. So when the underdogs eventually overcome the established order against all odds, it's not just a victory of Blue Lock's philosophy of egoism against the Japanese status quo. The end of the match also sees Sai acknowledge that his beliefs were misguided all along. Sai's mistake was losing faith in the face of an ailing system, and giving up on Japanese football altogether. But Isagi's final goal proves that Sai's dreams can be fulfilled by Japan's national team after all. In that light, it's worth looking at Sai's fateful reunion with Rin one more time. I've already touched on how much the U20 match interweaves micro and macro level storytelling. 
how the struggles and growth of its individual characters reflect the general situation of Japanese football. And this is true for Sai as well. As a child, Sai shared a dream with his brother of him becoming the world's greatest striker and Rin in a close second place. But Sai's time in Spain splashes a heavy dose of cold reality onto Japan's newest prodigy on both scales. On a macro level, that the world's greatest player can't arise in a Japanese environment, and that he must therefore bring about his dream through European club football. And in parallel, on a micro level, Sai discovered that he can't cut it on a global stage as a striker, whereas he's much more suited for the role of midfielder. Now, I don't want to suggest that Sai was entirely wrong in making the switch. After all, his flashback at least implies that he doesn't have the kind of striker's intuition that comes naturally to Rin, or to Isagi for that matter whereas Sai displays unsurmountable dominance over the midfield throughout the U20 match. In my reading at least, Blue Lock generally celebrates characters realizing that they're better off in a different position. So the point is not that it's a failing for a striker to start playing as a midfielder per se. Rather, what makes Sai switch from striker to midfielder, parallel him forsaking national football for club football, is the terms in which he negotiates these changes. So let's talk about why Rin got so upset that Sai had abandoned his original dream. In my view, this has nothing to do with Sai playing as a midfielder. Instead, the real reason is already made apparent in the scenes with which the flashback begins. It starts with scenes of Sai being idolized through Rin's eyes. Sai is cool. Sai is kind. Sai is Rin's hero. On a fundamental level, this is the relationship Rin wants to have with his older brother to follow after someone who's even more amazing than he is. Now, I know that I'm on interpretively thin ice with what I'm about to say next, but hypothetically, imagine that Sai had said something different at his reunion with Rin. Not, I'm not going to be the world's best striker, I'm going to be the world's best midfielder, but rather, I'm going to become something even greater than the world's best striker the world's best player as a midfielder. And not, I'll be a midfielder and you'll be the world's best striker, but you'll be the world's second best player as the best striker. In that scenario, I strongly suspect that Rin wouldn't have had any reason to become angry. After all, what hurt Rin wasn't really that Sai moved down 20 meters on the pitch, but rather that he'd renegotiated the relationship between himself and his younger brother. What Sai suggested was that they'd stand side by side, and thereby he dropped Rin of his hero. Now, put a pin in the issue of Sai as a hero, because I've got a lot to say about that towards the end of the video. But either way, the point is that Sai, at least how he's being focalized through Rin's eyes in the flashback, compromised by abandoning his aspirations to be the absolute number one in favor of a shared first place. Just like how he gave up on becoming the best by winning the World Cup and set his sights on the Champions League instead. So that's the red thread running through the main U20 players. Each of them has been failed by the system and compromised in some way, shape or form. And by doing so, they effectively prop up the status quo. Aiku failed to challenge the established order as a striker, and Sai, forsaking Japanese football entirely, made his dismissal of Japan's chances on the global stage a self-fulfilling prophecy. So now, let's turn to the challengers. 
It goes without saying that Blue Lock represents a radically different approach to cultivating strikers than that of the status quo. But I want to hone in on one distinguishing factor in particular. In Chapter 8, Jinpachi Egel asserts that Japan's prevailing approach to sports gives rise to exceptional midfielders and defenders, read figures like Sai and Aiku, yet those alone would never revolutionize Japanese football. Now, why is that the case? Because the football equivalent of a true revolution is a goal, and goals are a striker's prerogative. And note Egel's exact wording here. In his view, strikers are destroyers who bring about a revolution by destroying the enemy's formation. Flash forward to the U20 match, the moment of truth that will prove once and for all how Egel's approach measures up to the status quo. And as it turns out, Egel goes all in on the concept of strikers as destroyers when he unveils the guiding philosophy behind his selection. The Blue Lock 11, as a team comprised entirely of strikers, embodies a philosophy of successive destruction. Their concern isn't to stop their opponents from scoring entirely, but rather to simply score even more goals themselves. And note how elegantly the optimal strategy for a team of strikers coincides with the purpose of the Blue Lock program as a whole. Blue Lock's overarching aim is to overthrow the established order, and this revolution is brought about through an aggressive strategy that aims to destroy its representatives. It's really telling in which terms Egel rallies his players. The Blue Lock 11 will be forged into a battle group that will pulverize the U20 team and demolish the status quo. With that, the U20 match is transformed into a war of ideas where Blue Lock's victory must coincide with the complete annihilation of the established order. When Egel announces the starting lineup of the Blue Lock 11, he describes them as bullets who will facilitate an escalation of destruction. And that's exactly what unfolds over the course of the most fateful 90 minutes in the history of Japanese football. More concretely, the destructive impulses of the Blue Lock 11 escalate in essentially three stages. The first of these emerges with Blue Lock's first goal of the match. Initially, Blue Lock strikers are stopped in their tracks by their opponent's defensive line, whereas Sai draws first blood. But then, Rin starts an attack that leads to a series of rapid-fire assaults at the opponent's goal, that leave the defensive line of the U20 team in tatters. From Rin to Yukimiya to Otoya, each of them stretching the defensive line to a breaking point, until at last Seishiro Nagi lands the inevitable goal. That's what tips the scales for the first time. With their relentless wave of attacks, Blue Lock proves insanely destructive. So in the escalation of destruction that Egel mapped out, stage 1 is destroying the opponent's formation. And as the first half of the match unfolds, Blue Lock's brand of destruction suffices to even attain the upper hand. Aiku soon realizes that he had been underestimating his opponents, and therefore he tries his hand at some destruction of his own, by attempting to kill off Rin's optimal shot course. But as it turns out, even the best U20 defender can't match Blue Lock at their own game. Despite Aiku's best efforts, Rin proves that he far surpasses Aiku as a harbinger of destruction by scoring the second goal. And that's the state of the match once the first half comes to a close. Blue Lock has bared its fangs 
and the U-20 team has no adequate response to this incessant barrage of destruction. In the second half of the match, however, the U-20 team takes the lead once more, and it does so by offering a profound challenge to Blue Lock's philosophy of destruction. Now, I have to apologize in advance to everyone who's watched my Right in the Womb video, because I'm about to repeat much of what I said back there. So if you have, please feel free to jump ahead to the timestamp that I hopefully haven't forgotten to add in during editing. As the first half comes to a close, it's apparent to everyone that Blue Lock's philosophy of destruction has won out against the defective products that have been churned out by Japan's middling approach to football. And so, the U20 team has no choice but to call in their secret ace. Blue Lock's number two, Ryusei Shido. Now, the U20 team's coach, Hoichi, is initially reluctant to admit Shido into their ranks. After all, relying on a blue lock striker seems tantamount to affirming the validity of Egel's philosophy. But interestingly enough, this issue isn't quite as straightforward as it appears. Throughout the second selection, the manga makes it clear that Blue Locks number 1 and 2 are fundamentally incompatible. Rin and Shido clash both on and off the field because they reach the same conclusions through diametrically opposed processes. The greatest strikers to come out of Blue Lock can't understand how the other operates, and therefore they're unable to produce any meaningful synergy between the two of them. But the issue of compatibility goes far beyond Rin. As Ego concludes, there's not a single player in all of Blue Lock who can comprehend and elevate the entity that is Ryusei Shido. Now, you might explain this by pointing to Shido's aggressive tendencies or his unique reflexive playstyle but these are only symptomatic analyses. The underlying reason why Shido couldn't fit in with Blue Lock isn't made clear, however, until the U20 match. Namely, that if Blue Lock represents a philosophy of destruction, Shido is revealed as its polar opposite. To put it most succinctly, he's an embodiment of creation. One of the most notorious scenes in Blue Lock is the moment leading up to Shido's second goal, where the manga finally unveils his driving philosophy. According to Shido, the basic purpose of humanity is to leave behind a trace of their genes, a proof of their existence. In his view, this basic fact of the human condition can manifest in a myriad of ways. From artists whose masterpieces move and inspire humanity for centuries to come, to people whose ambitions lead them to carve out a place for themselves in the world, and of course, as the ultimate act of creation, the parents who literally immortalize their genetic material through their offspring. So when Shido declares that he manifests his existence by playing football, and equates his orgasmic pleasure at scoring goals to sexual intercourse, he's offering the most profound possible challenge to Blue Lock's guiding philosophy. Instead of destruction, goals can also serve as acts of pure creation. This also explains why Shido only found someone who could bring out the best of his abilities once he left the confines of Blue Lock that stifled his creative potential. With Sai, Shido for the first time experiences someone who grants him the freedom to pursue the depths of his imagination. And with this miraculous partnership, Shido manages to score two successive goals and overtake the Blue Lock 11. So when Shido scores the goal to secure his lasting fame and legacy, the goal with which the U20 team finally regains the lead, everything he stands for is consolidated through the name he devises for his ultimate shot, the Big Bang Drive. 
The implication here is that with this goal, Shido has given birth to an alternative future for Japanese football through an act of explosive creation, analogous to the massive explosion that shaped the entire universe. And of course, the entire sequence is pregnant with a thick layer of innuendo that consolidates the association between scoring goals and pro creation. <laughs> Jinpachi Ego says as much himself right after Shido's spectacular goal. Shido's achievements have secured a new era of Japanese football, a future birthed by Shido's philosophy where creation eclipses destruction. Japanese football will be reformed from within, and this change will be brought about with minimal destruction. In the face of a U-20 victory, Egel and Blue Lock might disappear from the stage, but the Blue Lock players will be absorbed into the existing system, placed in a prime position to rejuvenate it from within. Taking this even further, it's really fascinating how deliberately the manga parallels the advent of Blue Lock's destruction to that of Shido's creation. When Nagi evens the score against the U20 team, he frames his goal as a self-introduction. Yet, on a thematic level, this is not just the introduction of Seishiro Nagi. It's also the moment that proves the validity of Blue Lock's philosophy of destruction for the entire world to see. But then, 14 chapters later, Shido uses his second goal to announce his existence to the entire world. And significantly, this second self-introduction demarcates the moment where the U20 team at last delivers a philosophy that can transcend the Blue Lock approach. And as the match continues, it turns out that this philosophy of creation doesn't just represent Shido. It also starts to resonate with Aiku, the greatest of the original U20 players. Now I know I've already touched on Aiku's backstory, but what's fascinating in light of the material I just discussed is how well its underlying metaphor ties together with the notion of scoring goals as procreation. Aiku compares nurturing athletes to cultivating flowers. Japan's restrictive approach prunes down its players' individuality and thereby causes talent and dreams to wither away. Yet, in the face of this pestilent system, Aiku offers one final act of resistance. He solemnly swears that when a true striker emerges, he won't let anyone pluck its bud. In other words, just as how Shido equates goals to conception, Aiku's raison d'être is to breathe life into those who are threatened to be snuffed out by the established order. His, too, is a philosophy of creation, not destruction. So in this, we see Shido's creation in action, one lone striker revitalized his entire team to the point that they are ready to birth a new future for Japanese football. Now, back to the Blue Lock 11. Shido has offered a powerful rebuttal of everything they stand for, and yet they're not ready to give up. And so there's only one possible response to dial up their destructive tendencies even further. Enter Blue Lock's Joker, Shoei Baro. As a side note, if you thought I might push out an hour-long Blue Lock video without talking about the king, you were gravely mistaken. As Isagi himself notes, Egel's call to swap in Baro is a sign that he wants them to crank up their destructive potential to the max. And that's exactly what Baro does. He goes from destroying the opposing team to destroying allies and enemies alike. And it's through his fixation with hunting down his teammates that he eventually scores a goal and puts Blue Lock back in the running. Rin actually puts it into words best right after Baro comes into play. The Blue Lock team will win even 
if they hurt each other. Or rather, as Barrow proves, exactly because they hurt each other. Yet, while Barrow destroying his teammates suffices to tie the score, the challengers are still one step short before they can surpass the U20 team at its peak performance. That brings us to the most shocking moment in the match, and arguably in the entire manga. The scene where Rin Itoshi awakens to his true potential as a natural catastrophe, as a force of unabated destruction. But to make sense of this, I have to lay out what actually causes him to go down the deep end. For years, Rin has bought into the dream that Sai fed him, that they would become the world's best strikers together. But while Rin poured his heart and soul into following in his brother's footsteps, Sai ultimately trampled on the dream that for Rin served as the cornerstone of their relationship, and after proving just how large the gap between them, and by implication between their egos truly is, Sai declares that he has no longer any need for Rin in his life. This sudden rejection leads Rin down a path of vengeance. Sai has ruined his life, and so he will crush Sai's dreams in retribution. But as becomes more and more apparent over the course of the U20 match, Rin is misguided both in terms of his aims and his approach. First of all, what Sai tried to teach Rin, albeit perhaps not with the best didactic practices, was that you can't reach the top by using others as your driving force. Rin had signed up for Sai's dream instead of finding a dream of his own, and this would severely limit his potential. But instead of following Sai's advice and finding a unique reason to play, Rin kept latching onto Sai. Following and crushing Sai are ultimately two sides of the same coin. And I can't help but feel that this is another instance of the match's overarching juxtaposition between creation and destruction. And then there's Rin's second, closely related misconception, that the best way to destroy Sai is by emulating this loathsome sibling. This is made most apparent when Rin tries to copy Sai's scoring shot from earlier in the match, and the outcome spells out everything. When he merely imitates Sai, Rin's efforts fall short. However, the seeds for this were already planted back when Rin first felt his brother's absence. Without Sai to direct his plays, Rin decided to fill his shoes. And it's at least suggested that this led Rin to adopt a more cerebral, controlling playstyle. And more than that, Rin's flashback reveals that some of his most iconic quotes, including his catchphrase Tepid, and the claim that the pitch is a battlefield, are directly parroted from Sai's harshest criticisms on that fateful day. So in retrospect, there's some serious irony in Rin's original characterization as Blue Lock's ultimate puppet master. While back then it seemed like he was the one manipulating the entire playing field, in actuality it was Rin himself who was dangling to Sai's strings. But as Sai gets fired up towards the end of the U20 match and starts playing to his full potential, Rin's efforts to beat him at his own game start falling apart. And this isn't just because Rin thinks that he can do whatever Sai can because they are siblings. More than that, he's convinced that therefore he's the only one who can comprehend Sai. After all, Rin has been fascinated with Sai's football for as long as he can remember, and so he alone has to be the one to stop his brother. But right when Rin thought he had read Sai's intent, Sai manages to outwit his younger sibling once again. With that, 
Rin resigns himself to the fact that he simply can't beat his brother, that no one can. Only for Isagi, of all people, to intercept Sai's pass. Now, let the magnitude of this event sink in for a moment. For the past few years, Rin Itoshi has dedicated his every waking hour to destroying Sai. And yet, nothing has changed. Even worse, the gap between the two brothers has only widened as the days passed. This is what he experienced on the day that Sai betrayed him. And the same rings true during their clashes in the U20 match. This is most clearly communicated by a very deliberate parallel between past and present. Sai passes Rin with the exact same nutmeg cross elastico towards the start of the U20 match as he used during their fateful reunion. By implication, Rin hasn't made any meaningful progress since. Sai himself puts it best here. Rin will never surpass him as long as he remains Sai's little brother. So when Isagi pulls off the one thing Rin desperately struggled to achieve and devoured him in the process, he effectively denied all of Rin's efforts, everything Rin has believed in. And with that, Rin is practically forced to accept the truth of Sai's words. He will never become great if he uses Sai as his reason for playing football. This is the moment Rin's world shatters to pieces, and he stares into the abyss that is the purest, unadulterated source of his ego. Let me ask you a question. Why is Rin Itoshi Blue Lock's number one player? You might bring up his immaculate shooting technique, his unrivaled football IQ, or that he scored the most goals out of anyone in Blue Lock. But to me, those are all very surface level explanations. The real reason why Rin rose to the top, in my view, is much more fundamental. If the ultimate aim of the Blue Lock program is to demolish the status quo, it only makes sense that the one who reaches the summit in such an environment would be its greatest destroyer. And so, when Rin sees everything he worked for crumble to dust before his eyes, he finally gives in to his primal urges and unleashes truly unprecedented levels of destruction. From destroying the opponents to destroying your allies, Rin's awakening brings the ongoing escalation of destruction to its logical conclusion, to destroying himself. More concretely, Rin strips himself bare of everything outside of himself, his team, his rivalries, his vengeance, and finds the one thing that remains the underlying source of all his desires, a compulsive urge to destroy. And that's, of course, exactly what he does in perhaps the most gruesome spectacle in the entire manga. And that's exactly what he does in perhaps the most gruesome spectacle in the entire manga. He humiliates the U20 defenders, one after the other, by shutting down their greatest strengths. That's the brand of hideous destruction that Rin unveils once he steps out of Sai's shadow. And with that, Rin Itoshi emerges as the natural endpoint of the Blue Lock program. The greatest striker, an avatar of sheer destruction. But as the camera pans over to Blue Lock's mastermind, we get a very unexpected reaction. Jimpachi Ego looks flabbergasted, like a modern-day Dr. Frankenstein staring in horror upon the monster of his own devices. It's beyond a sliver of doubt that Rin's hideous destruction is the inevitable culmination of Ego's life's work. And yet, 
he realizes only now that he's unleashed a force beyond his control. Ego designed his team as an unceasing maelstrom of destruction, raging on more fiercely by the minute and consuming everything in its wake. So as I've laid out to this point, the second half of the U20 match can really be reduced to a contest between two competing ideas, a force of creation versus a power of destruction. And what's so fascinating about this juxtaposition is that, if you think about it, this is really just a larger scale version of the clash between Rin and Shido from the third selection. In the U20 match, both teams are playing for the same purpose, namely to pave the way for a new future of Japanese football, but they pursue this goal through diametrically opposed approaches each spearheaded by the personification of their respective philosophy. Yin and Yang, creation and destruction, reforming from within versus dismantling from the outside. Ego himself spells this out right before the match. When presented with two players evenly matched in terms of skill but with completely different brands of egoism, Ego chose Rin and Sai chose Shido, and the outcome of the U20 match will determine once and for all whose type of ego, whose philosophy will prevail. Well, that's what Ego said, but as the end of the match comes into sight, the manga has made it clear that both of their approaches can't possibly usher in this new era. Shido's philosophy of creation might present a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reform Japanese football from within. And yet, the same match has unequivocally shown that the corruption that infests the existing power structures simply runs too deep. In the grand scheme of things, all of Blue Lock's efforts can only amount to a tiny blip on the radar. Not even the efforts of the greatest superstar could feasibly nurse the ailing system back to health. But on the flip side, Rin's philosophy of destruction is not concerned with the future of Japanese football at all. His approach of casting aside everything beyond himself might reduce the current system to rubble, but in the end, it leaves only ruins in its wake. So now, let's finally talk about how Blue Lock resolves this impasse, and particularly about the emergence of a hero. Now, I know I've been yapping incessantly about how the U20 match serves to determine the future of Japanese football for a solid 40 minutes or so now, but I've yet to touch on one final aspect that really cuts to the core of this. Throughout the match, this future is being negotiated through one term in particular. After Sai scores the first goal, the commentators proclaim that in this match they might witness the birth of a hero. Now this term is highly significant because the idea of a hero goes back to Blue Lock's very first chapter. The purpose of the Blue Lock program is to create the world's best striker, yes, but Egel also defines this in a different way. He is out to create a single hero who will stand atop 299 corpses. So when the commentators of the U20 match insistently search for a hero, the narrative implies that they are thinking of the exact same figure as Ego. This hero is a player who will lead Japan to a World Cup victory. Or to put it differently, if the match gives rise to a true hero, the future of Japanese football will be secured. And what's fascinating is that throughout the U20 match, the manga nominates multiple candidates who might don this heroic mantle. I'll talk about Sai as Japan's hero in a moment, but let me first go over some of the other nominees. 
The first time the commentators entertain the notion that someone else might become the hero of the match is after Nagi's spectacular goal. Blue Lock's first proper showing elicits a sense of trepidation, a mixture of joy and confusion among the audience. And there's good reason for this sudden shift in the audience. Nagi's goal showcased technique beyond their wildest imaginations. And suddenly, there's a possibility that something truly miraculous is around the corner. And after Blue Lock ties the score, the U20 players finally feel the fire under their skin. And so, their leading striker Sendo strives to steal the title of hero for himself, only for Rin to shut down his efforts completely. And put a pin in this, because there's a lot of significance in Rin being the one to crush an aspiring hero. That brings me to the finale of the U20 match, where the notion of a hero truly comes to the fore. With both teams performing at the absolute pinnacle of their abilities, the announcers are now more than convinced that they're about to witness the birth of said hero. Now, before I proceed, I want to acknowledge a brilliant thread by Kira on Twitter about the significance of Toys for Rin's character, because that really made a lot of pieces click together for me. I'll drop a link in the comments, so go check it out for yourselves. By now, Rin has awakened to his true potential as Blue Lock's egotistic destroyer, and broken through the U20 defense. And in that moment, Aiku acknowledges that Rin might be the hero who will change Japanese football. That's what's at stake with Rin's final shot of the match. This is the proving ground for Rin's philosophy of destruction. But Rin's attempt is blocked. And therefore, by implication, the manga communicates that pure destruction can't bring about a new era. Yet the spread of Rin's shot, with Rin as it were cutting off Aiku's interior monologue, makes it clear that Blue Lock's number one fosters no ambitions to become a hero. The way the page is laid out suggests that Rin is killing off the very notion of a hero arising from the U20 match altogether. Yet the connection between Rin and heroism runs much deeper and the foundation of this has already been laid in his backstory. In the time before Rin had taken up football, we see him playing with two action figures, a hero and a monster. But what's significant here is that this mock battle doesn't seem to present any clear-cut winner. It's as if these toys represent two potential futures for Rin, at this stage, it's not yet determined if he's to become the hero of Japanese football or the monster that will wreak havoc on everything in his wake. It's only when Sai casts Rin aside that the younger sibling's true nature surfaces. Rin's response is to break apart every keepsake of the time he followed Sai's dream. This is the genesis of Rin the Destroyer. That brings us to chapter 147, the final installment of the U20 match. And it's really striking how it opens with a close-up of the hero figure that Rin must have smashed to pieces in a fit of rage. It's a subtle yet incredibly significant metaphor, which in my view works on three levels. First, it finally resolves the tension between hero and monster from Rin's backstory. The shot makes it clear that Rin chose the monster, and thereby destroyed every possibility that he'd become the hero of Japanese football. But now, let's turn to Sai one last time. In his backstory, we see an awestruck Rin gazing at Sai's football, and with his toys in hand, wishing he could become like Sai, that he could become like his hero. 
And this really cuts to the heart of Sai Itoshi's character. At the beginning of the U20 match, Sai is painted as the obvious candidate to become the hero of Japanese football. Sai is Japan's most promising upcoming player, and it's made abundantly clear that Sai towers far above everyone else on the field. But there's one more factor that makes Sai seem almost fated to harbor a new future, and that's his brand of football, which is characterized as destroying beautifully. It's an elegant yet deadly playstyle that pinpoints not just the most dangerous, but also the most mesmerizing plays. And more than that, Sai's football is also cast as the polar opposite of Rin's once he awakens to his true nature and destroys hideously. Now, I've talked about how Rin's initial playstyle was basically an attempt to copy that of Sai, down to its very foundation. From his earliest childhood, Rin had been fascinated by Sai's beautiful destruction. So now, finally, we have the context to fully appreciate the significance of this scene from the second selection, where Isagi found himself spellbound by the beauty of Rin's parabola. This is Rin's most successful attempt at imitating Sai's beautiful destruction. Throughout the U20 match, we've been shown just how many emotions football can elicit. From excitement to shock, the viewers experience an absolute emotional roller coaster. But if we're talking about football that draws people in, there's nothing in the series that surpasses Sai's beautiful destruction. From Rin to Isagi to all the spectators in the U20 match, this is the football that can resolve the impasse between creation and destruction. The football with the potential to bring down a failing system, while also promising a hope for a greater tomorrow. That's what makes Sai Itoshi a downright tragic character. He had everything he needed to become the hero of Japanese football in the palm of his hand, and yet he failed to do so. All because Sai couldn't bring himself to believe in said future. So that's the second meaning of the broken hero in chapter 147. As the curtains fall, the prophesied hero proved unable to fulfill his role. And that closely correlates to meaning number three. This is the chapter featuring the final showdown between Sai and Rin. And here, at long last, Rin surpasses his brother by leaning in to his most hideous side. The monster crushes the hero. And so, if Japanese football is to be reborn, a new hero has to rise up from the ashes to defeat, to surpass the monster. A hero who trusted his teammates and called down the luck for a final shot, for a winning goal in the last minute. His shot blazes like a meteor against the backdrop of a starry sky. This is the birth of a hero who took down the monster, who took down the established order with a shot that transfixed the eyes of an entire nation and breathed life into the dream of winning the World Cup. And in doing so, Yoichi Isagi has surpassed Rin with a majestic display of beauty. For everyone who stuck to the end of the video, thanks so much. This is a project I've been wanting to bring out for a year by now, and it's honestly surreal that it's finished. I'm also sorry for the extended hiatus. As you might know, I was working on a three-part analysis of Sound Euphonium, which is my favorite anime of all time. And in all honesty, I'm just as tremendously proud of that as I am of this video. So if you're at all interested, do consider going to my second channel. But either way, I'm very happy to get back to my regular scheduled content. So if you enjoyed this video, 
I'll be putting out more in-depth Blue Lock analysis every other week, and I hope to be seeing you again sometime soon.